Hello. We're here. Will Schofield and Dan Cons. Where have you come from, mate? You've come running into frame. How are you? Bolted. Yeah, Charlie isn't here. He's in Albany for a little while. Um, a little while. He could be, you know, you know. I never see Charlie again. <laughs> That's true. So. Um, so I had to run and push the button and come back. So, yeah, yeah. Um, And also, do I, uh, did you give me a little fresh beer here? I didn't even realise I'd. Uh, it was full. No, no, no it's, that's how we do it here at Back Chat, mate. Start with a full beer, right on the table. Um, how are you, mate? Had a good yeah, week? Yeah, excellent. Um, you, be feeling like, you feeling okay? Well, I'm a bit tired from that run. And also, um, so this week I started riding my bike to work. My Did bicycle. You? Yep. That's yeah, good. Road bike, not a, like electric or anything. Um, well, it wouldn't be riding. You'd be just, just be pressing the button. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Um, my butt is really sore. There's like those two sort of bones that are, cl- that are connected to your leg. Wow. And I have padded pants. Um, oh, of course. Like the lycra pants. Because I used to ride a fair bit. I used to ride about 100 k's a week. Please at, at tell peak. me more about this. So I've got the, the full lycra pants with the <laughs> with the cushioning in the butt. And okay. it's still... So you're going full lycra. Like you're, you're on a road bike. Yeah. Full lycra. Uh, well, not full lycra. I've got shorts on over the top of the lycra. And I've got um, like a, just a tee. I'm not wearing the, the top lycra. Why? Well, then I can put my phone in my pocket so I can listen to music. I know you're not really meant to do that when you're riding a bike on the road. Um, oh, we, better I also, t- we better tick that box. He's not breaking any <laughs> rules, anyone. He is not breaking the law. Um, but I um, I just don't think people want to see me in just Lycra. No. So no, I thought I'll put no, a pair of shorts on over the top. Good. Um, yeah. Okay, sore ass. Well, uh, in other big news, we've got Andrew Bogut on the show today. Yeah. So I'm a bit Almost excited. Almost as big it. as that. Yeah, I'm a bit excited about that. Um, big fish. Good man. I... I um, a lot of people this week have been asking me, oh, great get, Andrew Bogut. Mm. Big big celebrity. Yeah. Much bigger than Dan. Just. Mm. Just. And really, I'll tell you now how it happened. I said, I want to interview Andrew Bogut. Mm. So I contacted Andrew Bogut and he said, let's do it. Yeah. That's he's, a he's testament a straight, to him. Straight up, man. So yeah. we got him a little later in the show. Very excited. Um, look, he's outspoken. He's yeah. opinionated. He does his thing. But... It, I also think he calls it how it is. So it should be an interesting interview. We're going to get into a bit of stuff, but you know I'm not the biggest basketball fan. So I'm not I'm not no. going to ask him about, I don't know, the results last week or even – I wouldn't even know how he's sort of gone down in his career really, which is poor by me, but I'm more interested on, in like the bigger picture stuff, the mindset, the insight, the, you know, him being a first-round draft pick, Australian athlete in an American sport. Yep. How does that go down? How do you feel? Does yeah, exactly. Feel? And, I mean, not everyone is a basketball fan, so that's acceptable. And a bit of a preamble of Andrew Bogut. Yep, he was number one draft pick. Australian, yes. played yes. for the Milwaukee Bucks for a number of years, yes. then was traded, played for the Golden State Warriors at a time when Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, Draymond Green, they've oh, they formed are. this crazy team. They went um, just a record. He won a championship. He is, a, he is an NBA champion. Oh, he's a, a proper, properly big celebrity. Played with Le- LeBron in, in Cleveland. He's a proper big dog. Yeah. So is it is a good get, but also he's very, just, you know, down-to-earth guy. Humble guy. Says it how it is. We love it. So that's coming up. Um, as always, you can catch us on socials, Instagram, backchat underscore podcast, Twitter, backchat underscore pod, Reddit, do your thing, uh, forward slash backchat, TikTok, same as Insta, backchat underscore podcast. Yeah. You can email us for the greatest segment behind social media, which is you send it, we read it. Hello at backchatpodcast.com.au. And big, big news, big news last week. We had Sam Butler on the show. So we've gone Sam Butler, Andrew Bogut. Yeah, you know what? Butsy's a big dog too. Yeah, he is. But we rolled out our YouTube channel. Um, And we've been speaking about it all year that we're sort of trying to do a few things in, in in the content production space. Well, this is where it's heading. Where we are, to use a word that was used way too much in COVID, we're pivoting. Mm. We're we're pivoting a little, um, but it's not so much of a pivot and more so of an upgrade. We're yeah. doing video, full video content. So every episode is going to be on YouTube, yep. but a YouTube channel, Backchat 2.0. Yeah, if you search that, we're still we're, we're still working out some kinks, but no, we're on YouTube. We are on YouTube. You're doing an absolute mountain of work behind the scenes, and we love you for oh, that, Dan. It's just worth it for the people. We love you for we it. We have so, fun with it. Yeah, well, we've got video content now, right? So it means our guests, when we get them in studio, that it's great, like Butsy. That's a lot, lot of great feedback. No Butsy in studio tonight. There was there was a lot of requests for Sam to be mm. back on the pod. He'll, I mean, he will be back. I it think has we'll, been extended. 
I extended. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get him back as a at a, as a semi regular, I think. But yes. too much butsy, you don't you don't want it. To, you want it to be like a, a birthday present where you get it every now and then. Yeah. So hey, look, like we said last week, he's around the corner. He's going to pop his head and he's going to come down and have a chat with us. Um, mm. So lots of things happening. So yeah, what we need you to do on YouTube. I'm not going to beg you. We're not going to beg, are we? No, not at all. <laughs> Hello, no, we don't need to beg. No, we jump don't. on YouTube. Give it a look, give it a look. Back chat 2.0. And subscribe. We mm. need you to subscribe. That way, every every time there's a video dropped, you get a little alert. Tells you when new stuff's coming out. We'll try to produce a bit more stuff during the week. Find some funny parts. Find some highlights. You can watch the full episode there. Or you can just do what you're doing now, which is listening to the podcast. Still going to be a standalone podcast. Yep. Um, I did promise our Patreons a live feed this week. And I will be going to them this evening. Now, I know you're listening to this after the fact, but... Full apologies. We had full tech meltdown. We had a, yep. a big dog guest ready to ready to go, and we, yeah, had, we couldn't we, we couldn't, couldn't quite make it happen. Yeah, but that's where we're going as well. Yeah, you yeah, have yeah. the opportunity to tune in live when you're a patron, so you can sign up there. It's gonna be live broadcasting. We're we're pretty excited to be honest here at Back Chat. There's lots coming. Lots coming. Um, what's happened this week in sport before we get to Bogues? What's going on? Um. AFL has uh, been cracking down on the vaccines. It's interesting. Mm. So a lot of clubs said, yeah, we're basically all there. 99%, if not 100. Some some teams have said, yeah, all fully, fully well, one dosed. Yep. Um, West Coast, uh, I think, are pretty close. 90, 98%. There's a few players that are still waiting on Where have you pulled that 98% from? Um, I saw a report somewhere that um, said three players hadn't been vaccinated yet. Heard it here first. I think it's more than three. Okay. Actually. Some uh, vaccine hesitant players at West Coast. Yep. Which is I've seen names. It's in, well, that's the interesting part I find, right? It is it is relevant because there is a vaccine that's been mandated by the AFL, who's a Victorian based team, uh, based based organization. It's relevant that there are players that are unvaccinated because of that policy. Yes. Is it relevant what their names are? I know their names. Is it relevant? Um, it's, it's actually not, no, because all it does is give people a, a target. Um, devil's advocate me. Why, why would it be relevant? I've, I've had a lot of people hitting me up for names this week, honestly, sure. in uh, mainstream, our, our lovely friends over at mainstream media. Mm. Why is that, why is that relevant? Give me a, give me a counter argument. So they can report it. They can say these are the people. Otherwise, if, I don't know, it's vague if you just say there's a few, but that's, it's not, it's... Cause, it is a mandate, and you want to know well, who isn't abiding by it. There is an, I guess, there's general interest. Tell us who who are the players that aren't doing it. Whether it matters or not, it probably doesn't. We saw this week Liam Jones retired uh, over the same issue. So um, yep. I guess difference between vaccine hesitant and I'm not going to get the vaccine. Well, there it is. Liam Jones said, "You know what? I'm not getting the vaccine. I'm done." Mm. He's a 29 year old turning 30. Uh, defender. He's a good defender. He's a full back. We love our backmen here in back chat. Yep. And if you want my view on it, anyone asking? Are you asking, Dan? You want my view on it? I. Th- you want my view on it? Oh, got you going to give it anyway. Go on. Well, I, I think overall, do do what you need to do. Uh, like, who, who are we? Who are, who is anyone else to sit here and judge? Or yeah, you can talk about it, comment it, have your own opinion. Just like you and I have our opinions on here. But overall, I, I think. You know, if if you if you don't like it, fair enough. Mm. I it, think as long as if you, you do, fair enough too. Yeah, as long as you're uh, prepared to live with the consequence. Yeah, but that's not if up to you. If he's convicted yeah. in that, yep, I'm happy to not play again and and not get it. Yeah. then that's fine. That's your decision. Correct. Um, and that's all you can ask is that you you, you uh, respect people's opinions when they when they are valid. Another player, Levi Casbolt, sees it. Or was it Carlton? He's been moved on. He's he's signing with the Gold Coast, having not being vaccinated, and they're talking about him waiting for him for Novavax, and they're talking about him not possibly getting it. Some news has started coming across the table that he is going to get it, and they're going to rookie him, and they're going to have him as a backup player. So, look, I, I just find the whole conversation fascinating. I'm not all that interested in names. I'm not all that interested in who they are, but the concept of um, mandating a medical procedure, and this is what's happening, and this is what you have to do, and you go and do it, otherwise you don't play we haven't really seen that uh ever in sport or in sport in sport in sport yeah 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 i guess so um like what what has there been in the past where it's like do this or you cannot play 
I'm uh, sure there's listeners like, hey, you idiots. Like, maybe a, a, a medical test if you get signed by a team. Uh, sure, yeah, you I have suppose. to sit a medical, and if you refuse, then they're not gonna they're yeah. not gonna sign you. Yeah, you know what? Great. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Um, but that is obviously different to a uh, you know a vaccine. Yeah. Um, I don't know what I was going to say to you next, and so I said, "Um, hoping that it yeah, would come free out, agent, but free agent, yeah. Hugh Greenwood." Um, I loved this. Covered it on socials. If you, the, of course, you can get in touch with us at Backchat all, across all of our socials. But if you want a bit juicy stuff, sometimes I get a little bit bored at night, and um, you know, just fire people up on Twitter a little bit. I loved the Hugh Greenwood story. So on Friday, Hugh Greenwood tweets, <laughs> "Yes, yes, I'm still at Gold Coast. Yes, I'm on the main list." Yep. No, I'm not leaving. Just helping the club out. Wanted to wanted to be the better man. And from all reports, Hugh Greenwood sounds like a culture guy. He sounds like consistent player, effort player. Yep. He's never going to be a Brownlow medalist, but he's also never going to be the worst player on your list. He's a guy you need on your list. He's a hard worker, yeah. hard tackler. He played you know. twenty games a year. Yep, in and under. He'll play twenty two. He was he was in he was in Gold Coast best ten players. Oh yeah, it's only, you know if, if he has to, an injury, or whatever. That's the only reason why he might not play. He's he's a good guy, right? So that tweet I think was genuine. By the Monday, he's signing with North Melbourne. He's literally signed a deal with North Melbourne, who, um, you know, under the cover of darkness, perhaps. Um, Wayne Campbell, uh, he's somewhere footy operations of Gold Coast has come out and said, look, this isn't what we wanted to happen. North Melbourne have hoodwinked us a little bit, found a loophole. No, no they didn't, Wayne. North Melbourne played by the rules. Played the game. You delisted a consistent role-playing midfielder in a team that has been abysmal for is, since its existence. Yes. It's never been good. You've had trouble with ret- retention of players. You've had trouble with culture. You've had trouble with winning culture. You've had trouble with consistency. And you go and, yeah, you've got some list moves to make and you've got to shuffle the deck a little bit to maybe fit some salaries in that they need to or maybe future planning. But you go and delist a consistent role-playing midfielder that is in the age group of leadership. And you know what? Sucked in Gold Coast. That is just, it's just poor management. They yeah, had a little bit of a sook about it and North Melbourne have gone whack. You know what? You don't want him, we'll have him. And mm. we'll take him before the deadline. And they did. And Hugh Greenwood comes out with a tweet three days later after he'd come out and defended the club, defended everyone. Said, you know what, guys? Put my hand up. Not that I stuffed up, but I own this. This is what happened. Got delisted. Better off it came up. I'm off to North. Yeah, let's ask Andrew Bogan about it later All because right. I would like to get his insight. The NBA, mm. which is where he spent most of his career, yeah. is a, no- a whole other beast when it comes to signing and trading players. So it'd be good to get his take on that. Yeah, I love it. Um, look, there's been plenty going on, but I'm actually pretty keen to get into Andrew Bogan. Yes, and but first, we have to go to you, Sender. We read it. Are we going to do that for four, Andrew? Should we? Oh, sure. As well. Okay. Let's yeah. finish on a high. We're going to finish on the guest. Not that, not that um, you send it, we read it is any less of a thing than Andrew Bogut. Uh, you send it, we read it. Let's slot him in before Andrew Bogut. Let's yeah, do it. Sure. Yeah. You want to send it, you read it? Do I need to read out who it's from? Yeah, sure. Benjamin Fletcher. Thank you for getting in touch, Ben. Hi, guys. Dino's mate here. As you may recall, um, he did go and speak to my father, Dino. At the servo? At the servo where he works and says, oh, you Dan's dad. And, oh, yep. What a moment. Uh, what a moment So, time. yes, that, that was Ben. Um, <laughs> my question is for Will. Nothing for Dan again. Well, thank you, Ben. Sorry, Dan. Um, I'll tell Dino that. And, uh, He'll thank- just speak to Dino. He wants any, any, any information from the consters. Yeah. He'll just go down and chat to Dino. Consts. Go chat to Dino, yep. Uh, so, question... Change the vowel there. It sounds like a good word. <laughs> uh, when AFL players do appearances or jobs on the side, clinics, etc., how do these get paid? It's a pretty irrelevant question, but curious to know the ins and outs of this. Does the club put this stuff into your pay, or do AFL players have ABNs for this type of stuff? Warm regards. It's not a relevant question. It's a good one, because... <clears throat> there's a few different models of it, right? So there's there's appearances you do within the CBA, which is uh, the collective bargaining bargaining agreement, which all players are under. They they sign a contract that falls within that. That's where the uh, media money from the AFL comes. That's where sponsorship money from the club comes all into one pool and the CBA dictates what you have to do in order to receive your contract. Yep. And a part of that is... Uh, school clinics, maybe uh, you know, given COVID times, online interaction with students, um, some 
sponsor related work that you may um, sign a deal within the club, which is in the CBA, where you go to a Hungry Jacks, right? For, you go hang out there at a Hungry Jacks, which I've done before. Not not many people came, and so they all fall under what's I guess you know legal avenues of making money as an AFL player, and they are within your contract. You have around about twelve a year that are mandated, like. Talk about vaccine mandates. Well, these are appearance mandates. You must do them or you don't get your contract. Well, what if you don't want them? What if you've done your research and you think that's it's not a good idea? Read right between the lines. We can see where <laughs> Dad's going with this. Like, so that's one part, yeah. right? So, yeah, AFL players have ABNs for those sort of relationships. Mm. There's ones that are, and this is all speaking quite freely, as we do on this lovely, lovely podcast, which is back chat. You can jump on YouTube and find us and subscribe, yeah, people. Smash that like button. <laughs> there's the there's the other ones that are externally arranged um, by your management groups, perhaps. Um, Oscar Allen was on a couple of weeks ago talking about Monster Energy. Yeah. That would have been a player. That would have been a player manager organized relationship, right? And would he have to um, note that with West Coast? Yeah, he would. It needs to be a deal done with someone that doesn't conflict with a protected sponsor. So there's protected sponsors right. within each club and the AFL. So yep. Monster Energy, I don't think clashes with so any. If Red of that. Bull sponsored the West Coast Eagles, Correct. maybe there would be an no issue. Monster, yep, there would 100 percent be. And you, okay. you can't do that. You can't also do deals outside of your salary cap with um with club members or club associates mm -hmm. strong rules around that so the hungry hungry jacks for instance mm -hmm. who um, sponsor west coast um uh, more so more so dan const um has a bit of a business has a business that sponsors west coast yep and uh your dad then decides to approach me personally and says oh come and do some work down at the servo with me and we'll pay you a little, little, little lick on the side Yep. Well, that's Chris Judd with Vizzy. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. So there's none of that. That's how that happens. And then, honestly, speaking very openly, there's cashies. There's there's the there's the appearances that you might just go down to the pub and get a little bit of maybe just a little bit of contra, maybe maybe some free beers across the bar, or right. Maybe a envelope, a BSB here and there. account number, and say. And I'm also a little envelope with a couple of coins in it. Um, <laughs> okay. A bit of the sausage sizzle money in, in the side that exists, like. If people or or you know people in the industry don't think that exists, that exists one hundred percent. So there's a range of different ways you can earn money and make money, and most of them legal, and some are a little less. But overall, and we'll talk to Andrew Bogut about this. More more fan interaction and more engagement is better. Yeah, right. I, okay. th I think the more you can do as a player, the better. Uh, from Amiable Anderson, becoming a real regular on uh, you send it, we read it, we love it. Last week, Will was right when he said that he suspected that Amiable was not my first name. Yeah, that'd be a strange move by the parents. Well, Amiable. I chose the name Amiable Anderson because I imagine that's what Angry Anderson would be when he's not singing Bound for Glory. Bound for standing Glory. <laughs> on a Batmobile in the middle of Waverley. Yes. I can see how Amiable would be mistaken as being a female name because it does sound like it should be shortened a shortened version of Amy, which you said she. You were referring to as she. So it's not a she. Is that what that sentence means? I believe so. Mm -hmm. Anyway, my mm -hmm. question for the week. Basil got a bit of a bad rap for the way he handled the grand final awards presentation. Being an MC for a significant event is tricky, even at the best of times. Can either of you share a memorable moment when you've emceed an event? Go first, Dan. Uh, I'm going to have to, th well, look, I don't know if I've done any events. I've, um, <laughs> I think I've partly emceed a wedding. You think or you did? I feel no, like I did. That's, I did. That's, that's, that's right. I did, I did emcee <laughs> so a wedding. something you, you, you were there, right? <laughs> yeah, I was there. Right. Yeah, yeah, I did, I did partly emcee a wedding. Um, and I think I was on good behavior. I was trying to, you know, when the parents are there and I'm not, you know, part of the family, I think I was good behavior. So nothing ghastly to report emceeing like emceeing is hard so the whole thing with basil i had him on 6pr the next morning and i'm kind of disappointed that we didn't get it out in social i've actually got the audio clip for you dan but Please I, had, send it. I had him I, I, you'll read it yeah uh i had him on 6pr the next morning after the grand final i don't think he'd been to sleep and it was quite early sunday morning and i asked him about it and my preface before it was it's bloody hard. Like hosting events and emceeing, you're the guy and you're the, you're the guy with the mic, don't stuff up, podcast. Stick look, to time. Yeah, stick to time at weddings. Like don't disrespect the wife, the wife. Don't disrespect the bridal 
party. Don't respect, disrespect the parents. Don't mm. uh, play by the rules. Overall at weddings, just don't disrespect people and then you should be fine. Can I just butt in for a sec? Yeah. Because I just want to tell you about when a friend of mine, one of my best mates, right. MC'd a wedding. and He didn't pull out. Okay, go. Like, I mean, you could, it go. could be. Um, my, he, it was MC'ing another best mate's wedding and he married a girl from Rockingham. And he and uh, my mates from Perth, and uh, the MC gets up and says, um, "Please tell me you made a gag about breeding like rabbits in." No, he he said, "How do you know?" Um, <laughs> he made a joke yeah, first off. Yeah, oh wow! Up. So how do you know Jesus wasn't born in Rockingham? Um, because you can't th- find three wise men and a virgin. Um, that was <laughs> his joke. He got a call the next day demanding an apology for that. From who? From someone. Um, who felt that they, he disrespected the family. See, this is what I don't particularly <laughs> like. Like, yeah, I don't... I, look, I wouldn't recommend starting... If you're going to MC a wedding, don't start with a joke. <laughs> don't start with a joke that mentions anything about sex. You've got to keep it pretty vanilla hosting MCs. You're, yeah. you're there as a... That's the thing with Baz. You're there as a... Um, a vehicle to... Yeah, it's not about everything. you. It's not about no, you. That's right. You're actually just the host. Yeah. And you're meant to empower other people around you. Whereas Basil forgot to bring up Simon Goodwin, the coach of the Premiership team, didn't let Embers announce the Norm Smith medal. Um, overall, if you respect people and it's not about you, you don't have to try to be too funny. You don't have to be try to be too serious. Just be you and you just host and just don't stuff up. Yeah, the good MCs are the ones who you don't notice. Yeah, so about, have I ever stuffed up MCing? Probably, badly, <laughs> probably badly. I've, I've, I've MCed a few weddings. I MCed Mitch Brown's wedding. Uh, maybe Thumper's that's a, wedding? No, Thumper was my MC. Oh, that's right. Yeah. How um, did he go? He was good, and I knew he'd be good. Yeah. The thing with MCing weddings, I'll add this. If, you've, if you're ever an MC at a wedding, just know this. You're not good enough mates to be in the bridal party. <laughs> yeah. And you've got to, and you, you, you're trusted with some responsibility to not drink because or at least just have a couple because you've got to be responsible the whole night. Until you get to like the, maybe the dance. Well, mate, you got to be able to tell people when they need to leave. you got to – you yeah. gotta, so you, you know what you're signing up to as an MC of a wedding? A bad night. You, you're in charge yeah. and, you, and you're expected to be – Or a very delayed, about you. fun night. So just know that you're not actually that good of mates with the people that you MC. Like, oh, I MC this person's wedding. Yeah, you're not actually that good of mate. <laughs> uh, that's it. Uh, no, one more. Philip Tiling. No, Philip White. Yeah, it's Philip White Tiling. Yeah, yeah, Phil. How are you, mate? He's he's he's, he's, about, he's gone no, from the Instagram posts on socials yeah. to Phil this. Phil White Tiling has been a long time contributor of the yes. podcast. The thing about and I don't know if I should say this. So what you like, mate? Um, is that there could so if we're being completely honest, people send us a lot of comments when it's time for social media. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we get too many. We can't go through all of them, and we have to pick every the time. Best every ones. time it's the most popular podcast. podcast yeah, so. But the problem is, well, not the problem, but the thing with you send it, we read it, is that we have a rule, is that if you email us, we have to read it. If you send it, so I we think read it. Philip White, who is formerly known as Philip White Tiling on shift. Instagram, he's, made he's the thought, shift. well, it's if I need to comment on Instagram, then they can't, they might not pick it. Smart Anyways. Man, well done, Phil. Uh, that's my ramble. Um, hello. Is it a good, bad? I mean, that's a good move for mine. Like, if you want to ah, you get your stuff heard, like you North send Melbourne it. Like North Melbourne did, find the loophole, abuse it, and benefit from it you send it we read it yes that how, is about, how about this is a new segment it's not a segment <laughs> it's just a, it's just a request we we make it the podcast you subscribe to it on youtube yeah i like that one okay good uh okay uh hello will dan and he he did say and charlie but he's not here so i'm not addressing that <laughs> if the <laughs> afl mandates that all afl players and future drafted players need to be vaccinated Hypothetically, what if a highly talented draft player who hasn't been drafted yet and is being compared to a Dangerfield Schofield? <laughs> I didn't even see that. He, did you add Schofield in this list? To a Dangerfield, I did not. Schofield, Bontempelli, or any other great game uh, names of the game. Yeah. Thank what if this is not yet? That. What if this not yet drafted player gets the jab, then suffers from a side effect from the vaccine, such as? Um, inflammation and damage of the heart muscle known as something that I can't say that I'm not even going to try. <laughs> Myocardium. Um, subsequently, due to this, to the young player missing out on being drafted due to his recovery, taking sometimes years to recover, missing out on a big contract for many years, would this young player have a case against the AFL for compensation? 
Oh, Phil. And he uh, says, from the gnome and fairy killer, P.S., I'm not mowing her lawns. Yeah, so this is this is Philip Whitetailing who had the incident with the uh, next door neighbour with the gnomes. The question there was, would a player who was mandated to be vaccinated that had an adverse reaction to the vaccination be able to sue the AFL? You'll be compensated. Well, yeah, yeah. Sue the AFL. Yep. What do you think, Mr. I- ABC? <laughs> Don't. Uh, what do I think? Um, if you're mandated to do something, uh, as in you don't want to and you have to do it, and then something bad happens, I'll answer it. Cause I know hang on, I've got, I, a, I've got a scenario for you. All right, I'll answer the question and you give me a scenario. Okay, I'm going to... No, hang on, I'm going to give you... Yeah, okay. you want to answer it first? Yeah. All right, go on. I mean, they're not going to get compensation. Like, it's just not going to happen. And so, there's... Look, I, I, I love the hypothetical question from Phil and puts in a lot of detail. But in all honesty, I think we're just past that point. It's like, do it or get out of here. And then if you do do it and it, something bad happens, well, bad luck to you. That's pretty much where we're at. And that, if that's a good or a bad thing, don't know. My whole, my whole view on vaccinations and, and COVID and every, everything has shifted. I now just want everyone to be able to get on with their lives. I don't care if you like it or you don't or you're pro or you're anti or you're hesitant or you're whatever you are. Just leave me alone. I just, sure. want, I just want I want my mum to meet my grandchild. Yep. I want just, everyone just get on with it. Okay. Sick of the chat. Yep. Okay. Is that okay? Yep, that's fair. Um, you still going to give me the hypothetical? Yeah, sure. Why not? When okay. you sign a contract, yes. let's say you sign a contract with the West Coast Eagles. Big one. You are there, <laughs> you are then mandated to play games. You have to. If you don't play games, well, goodbye. You're not going to get your contract. Therefore, while playing a mandated game, which you must play to fulfill your duties to get that contract, you get injured. Are you getting compensated? And if you can't play? Yes. Okay, so what yeah, if injury it's... Injury payments. What if it's, if it's career-ending? Do you get compensated? Yes. Did you think the answer was going to be no? no? I didn't know. I was legitimately asking you. Full like, compensation. So if you get a career-ending injury, uh, you get a, a minimum of a two-year payout of your last contract. Yep. If you're on 500 grand, you get a million dollars. Yep. Um, in saying that, cases like a Dan Venables, who was yep. not in his maximum earning capacity, I'm sure is in discussions as we speak. We need to get Dan Venables on this podcast. Okay. Just note that for later. Thanks, Charlie. Oh, that's right. You're not there. Uh, someone like a Dan Venables would, would hopefully be able to negotiate compensation because a concussion like Dan Venables was caused by playing the game that he was mandated to do, if you mm. use these words, he should be compensated for the longevity of his career. High draft pick. Played in grand final his second, third he, year. He would be. He wouldn't be like your absolute top tier. No. payout. Uh, no. Sorry, contract. But he's not a rookie. He's not a rookie no, scale. No, no. He contract. would have been. He on, would have been on a on a good on a medium yeah, to good level yeah, contract. Yeah, probably medium. Well, he could have got it from a team but that that's was like thing. wanting him. Yeah, but he could have played twelve more years in the AFL, averaging seven hundred a year. Yeah. So uh, yeah, they are. Yeah, there is there is compensation, which there wouldn't be for the uh, for the old COVID. But that's enough COVID chat. Uh, you got anything else for me? I just want to get to talk to Andrew Bogut. So do I. Um, let's get into it. Andrew Bogut, superstar. Here he comes. Let's go. Alrighty. Well, we're here. Um, I'm, as always, very excited to be here, Dan. Uh, back chats are my seat, little little safe place. I come into my garage with all my boxes packed around. But we are very lucky to be joined by not only yourself, Dan Const, and we're always mm-hmm. excited to have you here. No, I'm excited. We've got a genuine superstar in the house. Andrew Bokert, how are you, mate? Yeah, going well. What's going on? Yeah, not much, mate. Look, I'm, my intros are never the best. Um, I don't like to pump anyone up too much, and I think <laughs> genuine superstar usually fits the bill. Now, we usually start our podcast with this question, right? And this is a question without notice, so I hope hopefully you've got something. When we interview, uh, sport, when we interview sports stars, we like to ask them their greatest sporting achievement not in their selected sport. So we all know what you've done on the basketball court. We know what you're about, being a championship winner, NBA player, finished his career in the NBL. Give us your greatest sporting achievement, not on the basketball court. It could have been when you were five years old. 
Oh, not on the basketball court. Uh, we got him here, Dan. One. We got um, him here. Come on, man. You, you I used mean, to play it'd footy be, in the It'd day. be poker related. It'd be poker related. Yeah, I'm going to finish on good. the Warriors uh, charity tournament, which was pretty, pretty, good, pretty decent players there. Finished on the final table two years in a row. Wow. Um, and I have uh, managed to stack Phil Helmuth a few times. So uh, a few. He's he's definitely ahead. If you know who Phil Helmuth yep. is, but no, who he is? He's, Good. he's the the winningest poker player of all time, um, and, and that that won't be matched, I don't think, for a long, long time. But yeah, he's a friend of mine, and I've got him a few times, but he's he's probably in double digits against me, so that'd be a claim to fame away from basketball. It sounds like it's a little bit better than your five for sixteen, Dan. Is yeah, it? my my achievement, and always like <laughs> funny, you actually mention it. I've just got the the trophy here. Um, is Five for is it, what is it? Was it five wickets for sixteen runs under twelves? Chuart Hill Cricket Club, um, which <laughs> it's a nice trophy actually. Yeah, yeah, that's the that's the ball from the game. Um, that it's was pretty good. Yeah, like eighteen it. years ago, um, and that's still to this day. It's beating most people that we bring on the podcast as a better sporting achievement. But I'd say yours is probably it's close. <laughs> I feel Bogues has got the ranking right now. I was a state champion as a runner, but Bogues like getting on the table, final table. Phil Helmuth, he's a Bad, bad man. I appreciate that and respect it, folks. Now, I wanted to ask before we get into a bit of oh, a bit of this is your life type thing with Andrew Bogut. What, what, what was harder for you? The time you spent playing the game over in the NBA. When, when did you start in the NBA? When were you drafted? Uh, 05. So, 05. And when did you finish? Oh, I, I played, I finished in 1819. Uh, that was my final year with the Warriors, but there was a. Yeah, I guess I came back to the NBA in between that. So 18, 19 was my final NBA year. We speak a lot of AFL on this podcast, and I wanted to ask off the bat, what was harder? Your career in the NBA, um, the blood, sweat, and tears of of doing that in the States and then here in Australia, or supporting Essendon and not seeing them play in a final for the last <laughs> 15 years of your life? Well, I, was, I was born into a good period, though, I'll tell you that, the Correct. 80s and the 90s. So Correct. probably probably ruined the next 20 years for me because expected so much success but um yeah look not the best probably two decades probably since the late 90s 2000s where we had the, the really good run we were you know grand final or bust every year um and then obviously the drug scandal and all that and we just haven't haven't recovered really like we've been we've been in the same pocket of the ladder for eternity i think we're like the new you know the new richmond for you know to be to be harsh on us a little bit where we're just constantly like fringe finals or 9 10 11 and it's kind of the worst place you can be in footy much like the boss uh, nba because you don't get a good you don't get the best possible draft pick and you're not in the finals so you know and, and at best you're you're eight and you're getting flogged by five so um look we had a better year last year i was real, real happy with our progress I, I felt like um i'm not one of those fans that every loss i'm 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 you know abusing the team i, I really felt like we had some losses last season that i could say Hey, we left it all out there, um, but I couldn't say that the last ten years, if that makes sense. Did you did you follow the AFL while you were over in the states? Did you did you follow footy? I did. Yeah, I did. Um, I when I first got there, it was pretty much impossible to get the games over there. Um, you had to all they would show really. You could you get the grand final. You had to go through like I think it was some European provider that usually streamed football <laughs> or, or soccer, <laughs> and then probably about oh five or six years ago, maybe more, seven years ago, they um, there was the AFL Live app, which for international users, you could you could yep. log on and watch every game. It was 10 bucks a month. So I love that. Um, I would I would watch, basically I could watch every afternoon game. I couldn't watch the night games because that was two, three in the morning. Yep. And I feel like sometimes I would have it on, um, even in the background, just to hear the, um, the accents and the whistles. And it was just probably more, a mental thing where it kind of cured a bit of homesickness. Um, even if it was like two shitty teams playing, I would just chuck on, on the volume and do stuff around the house. <laughs> and it was just, yeah, just kind of put, put my mind back to to being home. The sound of Dennis Cometti and Bruce McAvaney echoing through a Milwaukee kitchen. <laughs> That's what I've got my oh, mind. Oh, no, Razor, Razor Ray, mate. Razor Ray selling tickets on himself. That's all you hear most games. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. Um I want to take you back to when it all started in the NBA for you um, as a you know, first round draft pick. I, I realize you do these sort of podcasts and these chats all the time and, and we do really appreciate you coming on. I wanted to try and uh, not change it up for you because I'm sure you've heard it all, seen it all, but 
get a little bit into the mindset of someone coming out of college. Um, you obviously put a lot of hard yards in as a young player. You get a lot of expectation of you. One as as a as a high draft pick, but two, you're you're like the great white hope, right? You're the you're the Australian, only Australian at the time, really doing things in the NBA. Did you did you feel that expectation? Was there a lot of pressure on you as a young player? Yeah, a little bit. Look, um, it was an interesting journey. I mean, my my junior career and everything um, developed really late, so I was wasn't really a household name, and then all of a sudden went from an unknown to like three years, I was the number one pick, right? So it all happened very quickly. And um, I guess going to a small market probably helped me a little bit. If I was in New York or LA, I probably would have struggled, um, I think with the attention. And to be honest with you blokes, I probably, you know, I probably wasn't ready for the NBA when I got drafted physically. I was, you know, scratching a hundred odd kilos, uh, maybe 105. And this is an era of Shaq and Yao Ming and Dwight Howard in his peak, and it was just guys every night that would just beat the shit out of you. <laughs> and I was, I was, I was, it wasn't my game. I was more suited to the way the games played today back then. And so I had to put on a lot of weight, a lot of bulk, and then I started to get better second year, third year, fourth year. So um, yeah, I definitely sh- struggled, but I had to come out for the draft. I mean, I was, you know, uh, picked to be top ten. Then later, it went in my college year. It was top five. Then it was top three. It was like I can't go back and risk injury. I knew that if I go back, that scouts would then be nitpicking me because a third year under the microscope, potentially a fourth year under the microscope, they start to find flaws that aren't really there because there's nothing else to talk about. So I was like, I have to go to the draft. But I, I knew like I'm not 100% ready to play 40-odd minutes, and, and that's exactly what happened. I remember um, seeing a lot of highlights of you um, in college, and you were definitely not a sort of bash them down the down the low post center like you, you used to carry the ball a fair bit you were a bit of a point point forward slash point center how did that change obviously you know college is, is quite a different game but then changing your game style completely to then going more of a low post sort of big man in milwaukee yeah it was an adjustment i, I mean i remember taking the ball off off the rim and going the length of the court and it was kind of frowned upon when i first got to the league <laughs> right because no one did it and it was like no, nah, you don't do that. You give it to a guard and you, you know, go post up. So um, I kind of, I feel like coming out of college today, I was probably better suited to today's game where bigs can handle. I mean, I used to shoot jumpers back then, shot a fair bit of threes um, in college. And um, yeah, they ended up just developing more as a post player. And, and we had another big guy next to me at the time. So, you know, it, it was much different to the way the game is played today. But um, I had to kind of adapt to that. And, and like I said earlier, that that came with with weight room and putting on weight. And I was always a late developer. Like I didn't have a hair, I didn't have hair on my legs till I was like eighteen, nineteen. You know, like I was always one of those kids that was like, like what the hell is wrong with me? Like you know, some of my teammates are growing beards and shit, and I have I couldn't even grow a pube on my face till I was like twenty two, twenty three. You know, so. Um, I knew that I was developing late and it was the same. I couldn't put on weight to save my life. I'd be like smashing Maccas, burgers, chips, everything, right? Just couldn't put on weight. Um, and it just came with time. I, I started to really grow into my body at about 22, 23. And, and that's when I felt like I'm, I'm in a good position now to bang with those big fellas. Where, where do you sit on the talent versus hard work scale? Like, I'm going to be honest, I'm, I'm not the world's biggest basketball fan. Uh, I've, I've followed Australians in the NBA. That's pretty much it. Um, where, where did you sit like as a young guy did did it change when you, you, you I hear a lot you had to change the way you played you a hard worker or were you just really talented nah to put the work in you know i was i was cut uh, all throughout my junior career i got labeled as having an attitude problem because i was really fiery and passionate <laughs> and i kind of knew that i always i always loved the game more than all my teammates um i knew that and they were they were just more talented at a young age you know it's a, the old adage of most kids that are the star and under 12s and under 14s never really turn out to be a pro there's there's the rare cases maybe like a pendlebury or someone um to to, to quote yeah. afl but uh-huh. there's a rare case of guys that just they just have it you know but that's a rare rare case you got to put the time and effort in and even those guys that have it they still put the time and effort in along the way. Um, so yeah, I put a lot of a lot of hours in that no one no, no one knew about when I was 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Even even in college, I would go and that's the reason why I picked the University of Utah because I knew I wouldn't be out partying. I'd go and shoot at night. I'd get the keys to the arena, go get some extra workouts in. So yeah, I think there are there's a real rare number, like a small percentage, less than one percent that just have it that don't need to put the work in. That's a rare number, but 
most most blokes have put that time and effort in over a two or three or four year period as a young fella somewhere along the line you, yeah you ever really just fall into you know being a professional nba player or afl player all that kind of stuff you gotta you gotta work at your craft and it's look it's changed today i mean you blokes would know like you know you guys can't can't even get extra extra goal kicking sessions in post practice because everything is monitored <laughs> on that bloody gps and, yeah. and that's how basketball starting to go now and they're over babying guys a little bit whereas you know in that teenage period i, th- I feel like the more work the better um it'll you know you, you don't want to be hindering a guy to be able to work on his skills oh no nah, mate you hit two hours the gps says you need a rest like what the fuck like yeah. <laughs> it's just crazy you know as a, as a mature adult in your mid-20s that makes a bit more sense, you know, once you once you are who you are. But when you're in that development phase, I'm a big advocate of putting as much time into your craft as you can as you can put. Where where did uh the so you mentioned at the very start there, the attitude side of things, right? People thought you had an attitude problem. Um just again from afar. Well, I did. well yeah, all right, okay, there you go. Like, did it change or did people just accept for you from more who you were? Yeah, my, my attitude problem was around guys not playing the right way and not playing to win. So yeah, hundred percent that pissed me off. And I would I would show it on my face. I'd scowl at guys at twelve, thirteen, fourteen years old. Like I'd scowl at the guy like taking five straight shots at five straight possessions and be like, dude, what are you doing? Like pass the ball. Your teammate was open. And so parents and coaches will take that as look at this kid, he's just he's got an attitude problem, he's got problems. I'm like, no, I just want to win. I want to play the right way. That's not the right way to play basketball. Like you're being selfish. You're trying to get your own your own accolades and points. And that's the type of singing junior sport. So I straight away got labeled. And I guess what I learned from that is, you know, when I see kids like that, I, I then, I try to, you know, if I'm working with them, I try to get that passion on the right track, you know, because that's invaluable. You can never, you can never teach passion, right? If you've got a kid that um, just plays because they're naturally gifted or you, and you need to fire them up every day, come on, mate, let's get working. Like, you don't want to work with someone like that every day. But the kid that like, yeah, one out of one, you know, every two weeks he does something stupid and flies yeah. off the radar. I'll take that kid any day of the week because there's other 13. He's going to give you everything he has. You might just need to turn the volume down every now and then. And that was me. Um, but no one from a coaching development point of view, the adults in the room, no one ever came up to me and said, hey, what, what's, what's up, mate? Like, why are you, you know, it was always just like, oh, he's, he's, a, he's, he's a, I'm 13, Here goes 14, Bogues come again. talk to me. Here goes Bogues again. Yeah, but, but you're 13, the you're 13, 14. Like, how can you label a child at that age you don't know what's going on at home. You don't know what's going on at school. They just like straight away label like, oh, he's this and that. It's like your job as a junior coach is to, to know your, your players' personalities, to know what's going on. And that's part of being, you know, a good coach and a good developer um, rather than just, you know, get your most talented team out there to try beat another team. So then how does that sort of adjust then? Because you played with Monte Ellis, right? And No, he was traded for me. Ah, the trade. right. So you would, um, would have played alongside like Brandon Jennings... At those yep. at that time, because he he would have been like, I don't know, he he was a very talented player, but he was a really like a one on one sort of guy. So I guess is it sort of once they get to a certain level, then you sort of accept well, guys are just gonna sort of play that way, and or is there a lot of things that go on behind the scenes that you don't know about? You know, players annoyed at each other for taking shots. And oh, look, Brandon wasn't wasn't too bad. I mean, he was he was feel, I was with him his first couple of seasons, then I was gone. But look, there, there are some players that clearly are in it for themselves um that's a part of professional sports and with the money involved in in the nba you know an extra rebound an extra million at times you know an extra two points is an extra million on your contract so it's like it becomes yeah we want to win but i still need to get mine um and that's 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 the problem with the amount of money in the game and that's a that's a pro and a con right so um, yeah, there are there are plenty of players I've played with that played the game for themselves, and it was clear as day. And and those players shitted me. I didn't like. I didn't enjoy playing with him, and you could see it clear as day. And then you're relying on a coach to have the balls to tell them. Um, and sometimes coaches did, sometimes they didn't. And you know, a lot of times if coaches didn't, that team wasn't very successful. We need to get some sort of um, cash for spoils or something in the AFL. I reckon going with some defenders, Bogues. That'd be a nice little million every spoil the boys <laughs> did. What, talk about money. Do, Again, as a young guy, you, you've walked in from college where you're not paid a dollar, um, uh, which has changed a little bit in the last 12 months. But you, you go from this, you know, maybe getting a few shoes here and there to being on a multi-million dollar contract um, and being in that position. You got people helping you or are you you're looking after that yourself? Yeah, it was tough. Um, I, I came from college with not even coins in my pocket to 
you know, signed in a multi million dollar deal as a as a rookie, um, it was I was real thankful. I, I lucked out with the agent that I went with and it wasn't because I was an expert in picking him. I, I literally lucked out and picked the great guy. Um, and they set me up with like a financial uh, advisor who was also a great guy. There's a lot of agents and financial advisors out there that aren't aren't the best um, and can, can, you know, do some damage to your books. Yeah. Um, but I, I thankfully work with good people and, and they helped me along the way. Like it was... You know, I went from college where you don't you don't see a bill, you don't see you don't know how to pay your electricity bill, set up your utilities, like just stupid stuff like that. You'd have no idea about, right? And then I'm moving to a new city. I got to find an apartment, got to find a car, got to furnish it, all that stuff. So they helped me as much as they could. And I guess once I got settled, you know, five, six, seven, eight years in my career, I started to take the reins of of all that myself because I knew that one day I'm going to retire. I don't want to get to a point where I retire and I still don't know how to pay a bill. Like then I'm in then I'm in some prop you know, in some trouble. And it also kind of bothered me that, you know, um, you meet with your financial guy and they're breaking down your statements and what you've got, where it is. And, and, and you're like, I didn't understand half the lingo they were using because it's, you know, they're talking like that. Yeah. And it's like, you know, yield, this, the, you know, annualized returns, all that, which I know now. So yeah, I ended up, I ended up going to do a, um, a course online through Open Uni of all, of all places in Australia. And it was, it was actually called Personal Wealth Management. Perfect nice. course for myself. Nice. Did, did that and now I manage, um, besides my taxes, I don't do that, but um, I manage all my all my finances and investments myself. So it's a steep learning curve. I've made mistakes. I've, I've hit some out of the park. I've, I've been fleeced. I've, I've, I've seen it all. So um, that's part of, the, part of the journey. What was your um, first big purchase when you got that first um, contract? <laughs> Uh, parents, so yeah, I bought um, bought my parents both a brand new car, and then bought them a, a, a bought them a house, paid off the mortgage, and bought them a different house. So I, I didn't really spend a whole lot on myself early on. Um, I think my second or third year, my my, my big purchase was I uh, bought a Porsche Cayenne Turbo S. Um, that was probably you know the first big purchase, but that was after a year or two in the league. Um- I wanted to switch tracks a little bit and, and bring it back a little bit to the Australian sporting scene with trading of players and player movement. So in the AFL specifically, um, we just had a situation where Hugh Greenwood uh, played for the Gold Coast Suns. They delisted him uh, to have a little play with their list management. Um, another club swooped in, North Melbourne, took him, signed him on their list, signed him to a two or three-year deal. And there's this big uproar about it in Australia, right? And as you know, I know you're a footy fan, uh, everyone's carrying on as if, I don't know, as in maybe North Melbourne broke the rules or they're not playing fair game. I, I looked at it as like, good on them. It, it's within the rules. Um, they weren't even bending any. There was no loophole. They just did what they needed to do. They got a senior player onto their list. Compared to that, to what happened in America, it's a complete shit show uh, from, from what I can see. Players go from team to team, um, in and out. Uh, you can be traded at a moment's notice. I know you've been involved in a couple of those. Where does it lie between the the differences between what happens in America and Australia? Can they become more and more alike? And is loyalty completely dead in America in any sport? Yeah, I think it's sport. It is like it, it, people that think it's like the one club player and all that. It's it's kind of um, it's hanging by a thread in Australia. Um, it's gone in America, and it, and it's going to be gone here soon. Like the amount of money being thrown around, and um, that's just the reality of. Of, of, of big sports that make big money that that thousands and hundreds of thousands of fans watch it's just something you got to deal with but there's still a lot of people that are hanging hanging on to hope that's not the case but it is i mean the greenwood thing is interesting um but but even so then on the flip side you've got players you know in your league that demand a trade which I, this is what i find crazy coming from the nba it's yeah. like you got players that demand a trade and then nominate clubs it's like hang on a second like you you, you want to leave but then you want to be accommodated. Like it doesn't work that way. If you want to leave, in my opinion, as an AFL club, I'm sending you wherever the fuck I get a better deal for. Yep. Yes. <laughs> I'm not exactly. worried about your, and that's what the AFL I think needs to do. If a player requests a trade, you can't nominate a club. That's insane because you're, the leverage is gone. Like if I'm a club, I've got, I've got to deal with this team. That team knows that that player only wants to come to my team. Well, baby, like I'm going yeah, have a second round pick. Oh yeah. Maybe we'll throw in another one. Like, I don't know if it's because so I'm, I'm Americanized, right? I love my American sports. Like I couldn't agree with you more. Like uh, there's a situation over here with Adam Chera, right? He was a uh, young player, Fremantle player, goes to Carlton, but he, he just said, I'm, I want to go to Carlton. They had to deal with Carlton. I, don't, I actually don't get it. It makes no sense. <laughs> That's not a trade. No, it's not a trade. That's like, it's just getting out of your contract. Really? 
Yeah, exactly. So the contracts aren't worth the written on, basically, is what you're saying. I can, you know, let's say I'm, I'm, I'm at a poor club that can afford to give me more money than Club X, right? And mm -hmm. so they give me way overs on my money. I sign it. And then a year later, I'm like, yep, I just want to go over there now with that contract. Like, <laughs> Yeah, you know it's 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 kind of yeah. I always laughed at that with, with in the AFL. It was like, you know, and then the homesick thing. Don't get me started. It's like I'm homesick, mate. Oh, yeah, I, I was. Nice. You know, I'm I'm eighteen I'm eighteen hours from home. <laughs> like, you know, you you can jump on a plane if you're homesick for a night. Go back to wherever you're from in Australia like that. It's not. It was one flight, right? So I'd always be like, come on, dude. Like, you're still in the same country. How are you how are you homesick? Talk like, to me. Talk to me about that. But, Homesick, like because I, I exactly the same. Com, not the same boat as you. I've been in in WA. I'm a Victorian boy from Geelong, and any time I see homesick rolled out, the only time homesick got rolled out for me was was contract time. And I said, oh yeah, 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 yeah feeling homesick. Yeah, I'm missing my family. Like exactly right. Get on a fucking plane, fly you three hours, go see your family. Were, were you were you homesick over there? Yeah, I was a little bit, but I'm making, you know, I'm living a dream, making a shitload of money. But, yeah. you know, in Australia, for instance, even if you can't fly there, you can fly your parents in or your girlfriend or your cousin, you can get them mm -hmm. on a plane, they can spend time with you. So, yeah, there were there were times, you know, um, not seeing family for long stretches. Probably in college, it was worse because I couldn't, you know, when I was in college, if, if you made a phone call to Australia, it was like six bucks a minute or some shit. So it was like, I had no money. <laughs> I barely had six dollars in my pocket. So I'm like paying for 15 seconds. That's, that's all I could have afforded. So, um, yeah, it was much easier later on in my career with FaceTime and 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 you know time differences and all that. But yeah, you still you still miss your family. You probably miss the nuances and the culture of what you grew up with. Um, you know, there were days. This sounds stupid, but there were days where I was like, "Fuck, I wish I was just a five day labourer so I could hang with the boys on a weekend and just have a barbecue." You know, and just have a normal weekend for once rather than having like. Because we, we don't, you know, in the NBA, it's like there's no Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. It's game day or non-game day. Like, we don't even know what day it is half the time, right? Yeah. So sometimes I'd think like, shit, I wish I could just like go have a couple of beers with the mates on a Saturday, you know, sleep in on the Sunday. Um, and it sounds stupid and most people would be like, you're an idiot, Bogues. Like, you're making a shitload of money in the best league in the world. But that's kind of how I felt at different periods of my career where I could just kind of you know, hang with the boys for a little bit, but that was a commitment I gave up. Did you used to do that in the off season? You used to come back back home and, and just have a couple of beers with the boys? Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and just, you know, most of my mates are wog mates, so we would, um, the, the barbecue would be a big peel on a spit and it would cook for seven or eight hours on the rotisserie and we'd have drinks around it and made, make a day out of it and then cut it off and then eat and then drink a little bit more and then, four hours later cut a bit more off and eat more <laughs> just like you know i wasn't i wasn't going on benders or anything but yeah that's kind of what i i enjoy doing just hanging around with mates and um just just being kind of not being the basketball player right just being like being me they're hanging shit on me about my heart you know some words would come out american and they'd just be giving it to me and you know all that kind of stuff so um yeah i definitely missed it and i'd, I'd come home and I'd definitely look forward to that just to go back um, for a sec to the whole trading thing, because there's there's a, a a case that I really want to get your opinion on, and that's um, uh, a guy that you played with, Harrison Barnes, getting traded from the Dallas Mavericks during a game, and then they just pinched him <laughs> so he didn't keep playing. So I think that was uh, 2018, and you, I think you, you did yeah. you get traded with Harrison to the Mavs at that no, same no. time, or was it just? Uh, no, uh, so he signed as a free agent, and I, I got That's traded right. there as well when they made room for Kevin Durant. That's so. right. Yeah. So then and the guy literally gets benched and says, "Oh, hey, by the way, you're going to the Kings." Or whatever. I think he ended up going. Or <laughs> yep. Yeah. Well, he he's a good friend of mine as well. That's why it's funny. So um, I think I was watching the game. I was on League Pass watching a bunch of games, and then I saw it pop up on on socials, and I'm like, "Hey, on a second, aren't they playing right now?" So I switch <laughs> switch back to their game, and he's. Harrison Barnes is kind of like me. He's like dry, sarcastic. So someone comes, I think, um, actually my co-host on the podcast, um, Mike Procopio, he was he was an assistant with Dallas at the time and he's like, <laughs> that's because Yo, you just got traded. He's like, oh, for real? Okay. And most players would have just got up and left. Nah. He sat there straight-faced the whole game. 
after the game, he's in his locker, like doesn't leave straight away, showers like normal, he's whole routine based and he's hilarious. He like he like tried to make everyone else feel awkward about it because he's just like, oh, what's the problem? Like, I'm you just going to do, I'm going to ice my knees after the game, I'm going to shower. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's Harrison Barnes, he's, held, he's an absolute pisser. But yeah, man, he got, he got traded. You know, I mean, come on, Dallas, like surely... You know, you could have waited another hour, um, let, let, let the man get home at least. But that was, you know, because his wife, I know his wife real well. I went to their wedding. My wife and I both went to his wedding. She's in the crowd and hearing like fans <laughs> oh, that gosh. didn't know that was his wife talking about it. Yeah, we just traded Harrison Barnes. Wow. And she's like, her head's like twitching. Like, what do you, what the hell is this wow. true? So she's in the crowd thinking, what the hell? So, you know, to, to your point, uh, Will, that's, Probably the downside of trades is that you know we get we get told on a whim you traded it and you got forty eight hours to report to the next city so it's literally a backpack and a small suitcase and if you've got a missus if you don't you, you leave everything to them to pack up and then you they meet you in your city probably a month later once they've packed up the house and boxed everything up and you know and there's some players that don't, that leave their family and kids in the previous city sometimes because their kids are in school so they hey just stay there till the, till the off season well then we'll figure out the move so. There's a lot of ramifications of trades that people don't realize, especially with, with players that have been in a city long term that have kids. I remember, um, you know, like the banner that comes up on a player, like, you know, uh, you know, 500th game in the NBA or something like that. The banner underneath Harrison Barnes as they put the camera on him was like, just traded from the Dallas Barracks or something. It's brutal. It's like absolutely brutal. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, crazy. Um, folks, what about, what about media and sports? So, again, big American sports fan i see how the media does it there i see how how sports covered really i see how um it's done very differently and then like post-game interaction right and like review preview it's very different america to australia and that's not only because obviously the fans are different and they consume in a different way but i i guess i wanted to ask you what your views are on the role of media in sport and how it's different between america and australia and are we just are we going more towards the american model here in Australia? I think you kind of have to just because, um, you know, TV and TV pay the bills essentially. Like um, we see that with NRL in Australia. Like they almost don't give a shit about the crowds to an extent as long as their their numbers are just so good for Monday night football. They draw no crowd, yeah. but they're just, they're killing the ratings. So, you know, it was interesting. The NBA um, media have access uh, before tip off. They have access. The locker room opens two hours before tip. And it closes 45 minutes before tip, so they can just literally Doorstop walk it. around our locker room. A doorstop yeah, it. they can just well, no, they can just stand in the locker room and not talk to anyone. And this what? was the problem I had was, so they can just stand in there. They they kind of eavesdrop into players' conversations. Then they can just come up to you and be like, "Hey, folks, can I get a comment?" Which is fine, but there, there's for every good one, there's a bad one, and and we get sometimes you'd have like random bloggers that somehow got a media pass, and then they, yeah. you know, we had someone. Um, post kind of someone's conversation that wasn't correct and so there's that issue but that's the the hill that the nba decided to die on and it's, it actually has helped them because they get so much access the more people they have talking about the game they think great and then obviously post game i think it's within 15 20 minutes after the game locker rooms open again same thing they can come up to anyone they want and ask them a question so and we're expected to for the most part um, abide by all that and answer their questions and then on off days, you know, tra training days are there every day. Um, every shoot around, they're there. So they, they have amazing access. And um, I guess they, they pay the bills to an extent, but it can go a little too far. Like we had instances where there was, um, you know, media from China that were, um, didn't speak a word in English. And I swear some of these people just got media passes through a contact, through a contact. And they were fans. Like they're, they're trying to take selfies with Steph in the locker room. And you're just like, I would lose my shit. I'd be like, hey man, like, don't do that shit here. Like you can't, do, you can't do that. Like that's actually frowned upon. And then the true journalists get mad at those people because they make them look bad. So there's that whole infighting. But I think the AFL is probably the opposite. Um, you know, you, you guys is probably still really in a sanctum, not allowed in here for the most part. Um, but you guys are starting to open up a little bit more, like post game and stuff with media running around. But I mean, imagine you guys allowing access in the rooms. 50 minutes before the bounce for media to just free for all whoever they wanted you know that's kind of what we went through oh mate like I, like just you talking about that like I, don't, I had no idea really the access like I've uh, I was on the AFLPA you know, the Players Association for a while and this used to come up every year like how do we get more money into the business how do we how do we give more access and there was always kickback from players um, 
I don't think actually players in the AFL, I can't speak on other sports in Australia, but I think it's pretty similar. They haven't quite got it yet. The athletes haven't got it. So the media doesn't have the access. And so what happens is media can't go into the locker rooms. Now, I think that's absolutely crazy. And you, you, you are me in the NBA, by the way, Bogues. I would be the one kicking people out. You can't fucking be here. I used to do it in the middle of... I used to do it in the middle of the song. <laughs> you know, they, they, the only access that photographers and videographers get is to be in the middle of the, the song. And I used to be the guy kicking them all out. Like, you can't be in here. Get the fuck out. You're not allowed this access. But without the access, they can't give the public and the fans, who are just as passionate, if not more passionate, than American fans, the insight. And so what ends up happening, it's just derives into this bullshit where it's just story after story gets re- reproduced, you know, regurgitated into just garbage, which I know happens in the States too, but there's just such little access. There's, I, I don't think, much insight. The fans actually lack insight here in Australia compared to the States, right? Yeah, to an extent. Look, I, I think in Australia, the media here is a little bit different though. Like you'd probably have like a Tom Morris, you know, um, writing articles on what, what type of spandex. Friend of the family, wear, Tom. Know, like friend get, friend of the family, Tom. Access. Tom's a friend of the family. Tom Brown. Is, is he really? If you're, if you're given a bad example, go with Tom Brown. Oh, maybe it was Tom Brown. I get, I get the names confused. Tom Brown. It'd be Tom, Tom Brown. Tim, It'd be Tom Brown. But uh, um, Tom Brown, yeah. But yeah, look, I mean... We're a bit more tabloidy here, um, mm. no, I'm much more tabloidy. Yeah. So, I think in the US they understand kind of, you know, even though I want to write this, it's not right. Whereas in Australia, it's like, oh, this will be great, yes. you know, new idea type style shit. Yes. So, that's where you got to kind of, you, you have to be kind of careful here in Australia because you, you've, you know, I'd always laugh at like, the one thing I always laughed at was like the doorstop of you blokes driving out of your training facilities and you've got a journo jumping out of the bushes as you're trying to put your ticket in the to lift the boom gate up. Like, hey, can you make a comment? It's like, especially after a scandal of some sort, so something happened on the weekend, you know, whatever, 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 just do the damn press conference on Monday. Have your banners and your sponsors behind you, as good or bad as it is, and it's going to end it for the whole week, but when clubs actually lock down and try to go inner sanctum, oh, we're not going to do it, rah, 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 it, then it's like a five-day news cycle, the same shit every day. And you're just like, if you would have just addressed it on Monday, yes, yes, it sucks for 30 minutes, but then it's over. Yes. Like give, that, that, that kind of access should be, I, I can understand the, both sides of it. I can understand the media being like, well, you're a star player. You just put your studs on someone's forehead or you did something silly or you, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. You know, Chris Jard in the, in the juice hold, whatever. Can you make comment <laughs> on it? Just address it for 30 minutes and it's over. But I think by clubs trying to protect players, like he's not going to talk to the media. Yeah. Then the media double triples down on like waiting in front of their house, like trying to you know catch them driving out of a facility. It's yeah. just like I don't think that's the right look neither. Like just do it professionally. Yeah. Speaking about the media, and as we maybe transition to talking a little about the NBL, do you think the media blew out your uh, relationship with Trevor Gleason? Uh, what was the? Well, what was like the I feel like because I, mean, I yeah. You know, oh man. It, People like it was just, Sydney, Sydney v Wildcats at the time, and this whole uh, thing around you and Trevor Gleason, like some of it was from and, some of it was it was from the NBL, like to, to pump up the rivalry, obviously, which you need. Um, but it all started because we played them my first game in the NBL against Perth. We played them in Sydney, and I think there was about two or three minutes left, and they didn't call a timeout, and uh, something happened. There was a technical foul or something, so um, Trev tried to huddle their guys on the court in front of their bench. And they were trying to draw up a quick hit of play, but it wasn't a timeout. So I just walked straight over and looked in their huddle because I was still on the court. <laughs> you're so, me. You're per- me. <laughs> yeah, perfectly legal. Perfectly legal. Like nothing. It's maybe like the, there was a strain in BL fans. Oh, you shouldn't do that. It's, it's bad sportsmanship. It's like, no, I'm trying to. If you want to draw up a play, call, call a timeout. Correct. It's not a timeout right now. So I was standing there looking in their huddle and, and, and Trev like stiff arms me in the chest. <laughs> And so I, I grabbed his wrist and like turned it as hard as I could. The refs run in and it got a big blow up. And then it was like Perth fans were like, oh, it's disrespectful by Bogut. And it's like, no, it's within the rules. Like if you want to time out and hide your play, you know, call a time out. I'm going to check. Of course, I'm going to try to check what play you're going to try to hit us with to hit a three or whatever. So that's how that started. And then it just blew after that. Like Angus Brandt made some comments, called me a pork chop. And I think now he's playing in Uzbekistan or Kazakhstan for <laughs> whatever he's playing for. I don't know where he's at. Um, it's hard to, hard to find where he's playing. So, But wow. it was good fun. And, and look, I, I enjoyed playing in Perth. I think they, 
they're, they're a really good fan base and they deserve a lot of credit. Um, you know, they get 11, 12,000 people. But um, I guess that was the one place I probably heard the most despicable things playing in the NBL. So I'm not going to play victim. But, you know, if they're on, on that side of the coin, it was you, you hear some crazy shit over there and it was just, just a part of the game. Wild, wild west over here, mate. When you, um, when you moved over to Sydney, was your plan always to get involved in ownership? It was in his contract. It was in your contract. How did you? How did you get yeah, that was, written yeah. into your contract? I was. That was a question for mine. What? What, what is that negotiation? How oh, I'll come play for you. Give me a percentage of your team. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. That's, that's how it went. <laughs> 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 um, well, well, don't forget. I mean, the NBL at that point, clubs weren't exactly a money printing machine. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, there was a lot of clubs going under every other year. So, I actually had a deal negotiated with Melbourne United, which is well documented and. Um, I was dealing with the GM at the time there, Vince Crivelli, and we we went back and forth on a few things and um, came to a handshake agreement and and what I thought was a done deal. And then I got the contract and he slipped a few things in there that I read that weren't agreed upon. And I don't do business that way, so I just I cut them off basically. And and I've, I I got got a hold of Sydney and said, look, this was a deal I had with Melbourne. You match it, you know, I'm good to go. And um, mm. you know, they they came to the table within a day. They flew out. Offered me the same terms, 10% of ownership upon retirement, plus a salary and all that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, it was probably the best decision I made just because, you know, Paul Smith now, majority owner there, who's also controversial like myself, we kind of bond very, very well from that aspect of things. He's a very, very astute, smart businessman, um, built a, you know, multi-million dollar um, in the hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars um, company in Repucom many years ago that... Um, that sold uh, and, and, and yeah, lived, lived over in New York and the States and all over the world. So um, that relationship is one I still cherish. We've got obviously Luke Longley's involved with us now, helping us out. So we've got a lot of good people. And, you know, Sydney was, was you know, kind of a basket case the last decade as far as professionalism and wins, losses. And that's no disrespect to the people there, but it just, it wasn't a winning environment or a winning culture. And I feel like we're starting to bring that back now with with um, just the way we go about things. So with ownership on the table, right? So everyone know that was that was that was open when you signed your contract, right? Did, did people people knew that, yeah. right? Upon retirement, yeah, yeah. 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 So so with on, upon retirement, you're going to own ten percent of a team. Um, you're outspoken uh, both in public, social media, which I love, but that's what you are. Uh, owner of the NBL, Larry Kesselman. Um, what was that dynamic like? Uh, I guess he viewing you and watching you doing your thing saying i guess just calling it how it is they're used to having the control of everything nbl that's they control it having someone going in a little bit of a disruptor what was that dynamic for you as a player and then now owner oh look larry didn't like it but it is what it is we agree to disagree on a lot of things we're both passionate people i think you need you need a, a level of agree to disagree to um further better yourself as a player, as a league, as a whatever it is. You know, if you've got people hired that represent you or your league that just, yes, sir, you, your league's never going to grow. Simple as that. Like, you know, the, if the people you're paying never disagree with what you say as the big boss and never get in a bit of a heated argument and back and forth, maybe a few, you know, choice words back and forth, I want to see that. If I'm an owner or a business owner or I run whatever, I want my manager to sometimes disagree with what I say and I want to get into it a little bit. So, I mean, Larry, probably similar to me in that, in that aspect. And look, we've disagreed on a lot of things. We had our little public spat. Um, but, you know, the difference is the NBL can somewhat, which I, which I realise that there are certain guys that they can, you know, kind of get their way with. Um, I wasn't one of those guys. So, you know, without sounding arrogant, I, I think my brand individually was was as big, if not bigger than the NBL. So it was kind of, you know, a tough thing for them to, to just tell me to shut up. Did you, know? you did you ever get called into the principal's office to tone it down? They wanted to moderate what you're doing on Twitter or wherever you were, public interviews. They they, they tell you to stop it? No. I know they, they would like to, <laughs> but no one had the Jones to actually do it. Um, you know, I, I, I'm the first to say I, I toe the line. I sometimes go over the line. I sometimes make mistakes and say the wrong thing and sometimes I'm I'm wrong on, on, on things that I think are factual and that's a part of life. I'm happy to admit that I'm wrong at times um, and I've never hid behind that fact, right? But no, nah, they've never really, they've got a lot of pressure from people but, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to try to say someone they can't have an opinion on something 
I mean, that's that's. I, I don't understand where the standing would be and what, what the ramifications would be. Hey, uh, you stop having opinions, or we're going to fine you. <laughs> it's like okay, <laughs> let's, let's, let's try to play that I, game. I, there would be stupider you know, things that happen in Australian sport. Seriously, I reckon there'd be. I, I I wouldn't put it past Australian sport to be doing that. To be honest. Yeah, you never know. Uh, there's still plenty of time left to, to to figure that out, and I'll as well and see what see what happens. But yeah, look. It is what it is. I think um, for the NBL to continue to get better, there's things they do really well, and there's things they don't do well, and they need it. Just like there's things the AFL do well and don't do well. Um, and if you can't look at yourself in the mirror, admit there's there's things that need improving. Your whatever you're running is never gonna get to its potential. It's just gonna, you know, kind of stay where it is. Um, we we've got a segment called social media. I'm sure you've heard of it. Um, long running, long genius, run, mate. Yeah. Who thought of that? Yeah, Who I, thought of that? I actually didn't. Uh, I would love to lay claim to it, but it's uh, you know it's worldwide recognised. I'm sure you've. That's the only reason you're actually on this podcast to do that. So we've got a couple of questions to cover from the fans. I love my fans, but I've just got a couple more questions, Dan, before we get to it. Sure thing. Uh, like big, <laughs> bigger picture, bigger bigger picture stuff. Um, this is a big question, so. Go with it with what you want. But culture within a locker room, you've been in a lot of locker rooms, been a been an athlete. Don't worry about basketball, just an athlete. Like what creates good culture? Is it the players? Is it the head office? Is it the coach? Is it a combination? What's what's your thoughts on good culture? Good and, and yeah, winning or losing. What what is it? Um, I, I guess the best teams I've been on, the front office and coaches provide somewhat of a structure. Um, yeah. and then the players police it. That's generally the, the, the formula for me is you have, you have an outline of what, what is acceptable and what's not. Um, and if you can get it to a point where the players are policing it themselves, that as a coach, you've won, you've won the battle. Now, if you're on a team that has a structure and the coach has to police the shit every day, like, mate, why are you late? Why are you do this every day? That team won't 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 be worth shit. It won't go anywhere, right? So I think that's the formula, in my opinion. Um, and by you know what the do's and don'ts are for me, it's be on time, if not early. You know, if you make a mistake, put your hand up, take your take your medicine, and get on with it. Don't lie. Don't 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 make excuses. Um, just try to be professional for the most part. You know, if it means going to physio, don't be late for your physio. If it means you know, you're on a rehab schedule, you need to do X, Y, Z, do it. So, um, yeah, all the good teams like the Warriors, even the Kings for a couple of years there, we, we had a great groups that just policed it themselves. The coach didn't even have to discuss it. Like, coach would just come in after it's already been handled, um, whether it be fine systems that we had, whether it be, you know, we had our own tribunals. In the Sydney Kings, we had our own tribunals, so you could appeal a fine. Nice. And the players were the... The, the players were the uh, adjudicators. Who was the fine master? Vote, who was democracy. the fine? Who was the fine master at a few of your a few of your teams? Who was the who, who, who led like, it? You mean? Yeah. Who was the leader? Who was the guy that was running those things? Oh, in, in Sydney, it was myself and um, Daniel Kickett were probably the ones that, yes. that that led it. But we had like you could appeal it. So like if you were late for a bus, um, we'd we'd go. We'd have to do like stipulations. So if it was four o'clock team meeting. At four zero zero is late, and we'd have to go to iPhone time because, like, athletes are clever. Some guys would be like, "My Android says three fifty nine, or you know, my watch says this." So we have to like put in all every little detail because someone's going to find a loophole. That's and great. then if you still think you were hard done by, um, like we had instances where someone told a player the bus is at four fifteen, and then he made a, the, the trainer made a mistake to that player. And he showed up late. You can go to tribunal and, and, and plead your case to the players, and then we'd, we'd, oh, we we kind of vote on it whether you good. get a fine. And a lot of time, you ever rarely got off though. Ever rarely, you'd always be paying something. <laughs> was but, it in uh, front of the playing group? You'd have to appear. Yeah. yeah. Buyout, uh, so, it's like, so what would happen is generally, what would happen is you'd, you'd plead your case. Like, like, dude, we had we had guys do like powerpoints trying to get off shit. <laughs> yeah. Like, like produce receipts, yes. photos, yes. like this. It was like it made it, it became like its own little thing as part of team culture and bonding that we just take the piss and have a laugh, and then they would have to leave the room, and then everyone would get a vote. And then half the times guys would rat out who voted against you and shit. It was like, it was quite, it was quite funny, and it just created its own little, it created its own little culture, which was kind of, you know, having a laugh. The, well, this, this is the sort of stuff that, uh, like, you know, yourself, you've been an athlete for a long time. It's, it's actually probably what fans don't, don't get. In my experience, the best teams have had the best, the best fines, the best off-field get-togethers, the best uh, connection with family and kids, and bringing the club together. The worst teams are when it's like performance-based, basically. You win, 
Everyone's happy. You lose. Everyone's sad. They're the worst teams to be a part of. The best teams are when it's the culture is driven by the players and and you have you, like geez, I wish I had spoken to you five years. I was fines master for the last four years of my career, and <laughs> if I had have run an appeals, oh my yeah, god, an board. appeals session, wow. It's incredible. Speaking of um, of culture, I've got one very selfish question to ask you before we get to social media. Um, there's a lot of talk at the moment around uh, NBA players, like the Dallas Mavericks in particular, I'm a fan, um, in particular not being able to get free agents to come play for them. When you've got a guy like Luka Doncic is, and like Mark Cuban as owner, are those things actually uh, reasons for players to come or is that just blown up? Like, why don't players want to come and why wouldn't players want to go play with Luka Doncic and for an owner like Mark Cuban? Yeah, I think that might change in the next couple of years. I think the Luka factor is definitely going to going to change things, uh, especially you know once they start itching conference finals or top four. I think you'll see a lot of people jump on the bandwagon. But Dallas is an interesting case. They just, I mean, they they just have never signed a, a, a tier one free agent. I mean, Harrison was probably the closest they've had in a number of years. Um, Pozingas came in the trade. Like they haven't. They ever rarely hit a home run with premier free agents. It's kind of strange, and I, I don't know why. Because Dallas is a pretty cool city to live in. It's warm, no state tax, so you save a shitload of money on on taxes. Um, Cuban, you know, they they spend pretty well. They want to win, but it was just a, a an environment that, you know, like a top tier free agent, you know, a LeBron, a Carmelo in their prime, even Dwight in his prime, they wouldn't even consider him. So, it's a valid point. Um, but look, some small markets are just you feel bad for them. Like New Orleans, for instance, they're probably going to lose Zion. As soon as he signs that max, he's going to ask out within a year or two. They will never be able to sign a, 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 a number one tier, a one tier free agent, like a top 20 player, top 15 player. It's never going to happen. They have to build everything through the draft, through development and through potential trades. And that's kind of the unfairness of how the NBA is stacked now. The big markets just, they have all the, all the leverage and power to create these big three and big four that we're seeing now on a yearly basis. And, I don't know. I don't know if it's good for the game. I think, um, especially those small markets and those fan bases that are pretty, pretty rabid fans at times, that they're eventually just going to turn off if it continues that way. It sounds a bit EPL y to me. It sounds a bit like, you know, the big dogs are the big dogs. But I mean, that happens across yep. all sports. That happens across all sports. Like the good teams are going to, the, the way that all free agencies are set up, no matter how it's done, the best players go to the best teams. They want to win. Athletes want to win. They're, everyone's wide. The they same. do, but but then don't sign the max deal with that with that small market team. You know, like that's a problem. So the NBA is at a big. There's a big, a lot of discussion around what's going on with Ben Simmons right now, um, and I'm hearing there is a chance that they just let him sit and rot there's actually a legitimate chance they might not move him. And I'm hearing that from, from a few good sources or a few people in the know that eventually there's got to be a team that someone signs a max with them, then wants out within a year or two that says, no, nah, we're not, we're not doing it. We're not, we're just going to eat the contract. You can, you can pout at home and not play because otherwise that contract that's signed is not worth, you know, the paper it's written on. Um, and that's what the NBA is starting to find now is that, you know, it's, it's just continuously happening. James Harden did it. You know, Ben's doing it now, Zion's going to do it, you know, and that's not good for the game either. You know, if you sign a contract, you sign a max deal, you should at least try to stay there for the most part of your contract. But within a year or two, guys are getting out because they get the security of the max deal, the max rookie extension or the max extension. They get that security, 200 million for the next five years. And then within a year, oh, I might want to go somewhere a bit better than this. Like, well, then don't sign that deal. You know, sign a one-year deal and then get out of there later. Speaking of Ben Simmons, been done to death. I heard you speak uh, multiple times. Heard everyone wants your opinion on it. I don't really. If if you want Bogues' opinion, go search it. It's all over the internet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. I did want to kind of backdoor that into playing for your country, though. So Ben pulled out of uh, the Australian team, going into the Olympics. I know you've you know been a big proponent and supporter of of what it means to play for your country. I wanted to hear from your words, like what that means to you, and when you see people not representing your country, what does that mean? Yeah, look, it's it's a unique culture that we had built there, you know, with with Paddy and Delhi and Joey, and to have been in that mix would have really given us an even better chance to to get above bronze, perhaps in the last Olympics. But um, look, my gripes have never been with guys not playing because everyone has their different reasons. Like some guys might have an injury riddled deer. They're like, oh, shit, I need to rehab for six months. Some guys might have just been mentally fried. I need a break. 
Um, some guys might be going into free agency. They don't want to get hurt playing for the national team. So everyone has their different reasons. I never judge someone for saying, hey, I just need to sit this offseason out from the national team. You know, uh, I need, need a break and no problem. My issue with Ben was the one foot in, one foot out. You know, it was like, I'm Team Australia for the marketing and I want to be, I want to be an Olympian saying all the right things like he's going to play and then pulling out two weeks before, um, you know, he did that essentially twice. That's, that's what's disappointing because, you know, you structure your training camp, you structure players that you're selecting for that camp based on your best probably four or five players. So you might have guys that are complementary. Like if you bring Ben in, you got to bring more shooting in, right? You know, it's just, just that. so then, you know, the coach has to change who he's bringing a squad when this kid pulls out two weeks before the Olympics, you know, Olympic camp. So that's what I was more disappointed in. I wasn't disappointed in Ben pulling out. I was disappointed in like, oh, yeah, I'm in. I love it. You know, woohoo, go Australia. And then, oh, no, nah, I don't want to play anymore. Oh, no, actually, maybe I will play. Oh, no, nah, no. Nah. And then it was like, oh, maybe I'll just play in the games that Eddie had, those two games against Team USA and be good for my brand. But I won't go to the Olympics. And we're just like, what's going on? Like, yeah. you can't, you know, this isn't a situation where you're one foot in, one foot out. And the national team generally isn't about creating your own clout and marketing and branding. It's 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 literally like let's go get a medal for six six weeks campaign. Usually, let's try to get a medal, and if we don't get it, on your bike, and we're we're back to the NBA. Uh, mate, could speak to you all day. Um, really appreciate again your time and patience with us. Um, a couple of battlers going at it over here in Perth. We do have to get to social <laughs> media because again, battling away our our uh, right. well our well our our software we use to do these sort of interviews crash. We had to use a new one, and we only signed up for the uh, free version, and it <laughs> shuts it shuts off at sixty minutes. I'd keep talking to folks for like three hours. <laughs> We're fifty four and a half. Yeah, we got it. We got five more minutes with you. So all right, social media, as you know, mate. Um, the people write in. We give the people a chance to ask stars the questions, and this is it, social media. We got uh, AC Noel eighty two. Did you form any lasting friendships in the NBA, or is it just all business and players um, going on in their own way? Yeah, yeah. Harrison Barnes was one, definitely. Um, Carlos Delfino, um, Leandro Barbosa. So they're probably the top three. Um, but look, there's guys in the national team, Jock Landau, Joe Ingles. So. Um, yeah, there's a fair few, but it's not, you know, these aren't, there isn't probably more than more than a handful uh, or two hands full, essentially 10, more than 10 guys that I'd count on for, you know, coming to help me change a flat tire or something like that. But uh, <laughs> that's about it. Well, Steph's not coming out with a wrench or something to help you change the tire. <laughs> nah, you know, he has he about 50 know. personal assistants. He wouldn't know what a wrench is. <laughs> Come on. Uh, this one's from Liv underscore Floro, love and underscore. Uh, you get to spend 24 hours with anyone on earth, but after that, you can never see them again. <laughs> Who's it going to be? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, it's the hard-hitting anyone stuff here, Bogues. Come on, man. <laughs> hmm. I guess it could be someone you don't well, like. It, it, if it could be uh, no one ever sees them again, it'd be Dan Andrews. <laughs> um, Good. Like that whack. I was I was wondering if we're going to get through 60 minutes without <laughs> mentioning Dan's Well, name. then what would you do with Dan Andrews for 24 hours? Would you just sit and have lunch and like a long lunch? I'd only need a few minutes. <laughs> we wouldn't need the whole 24. <laughs> I'd only need a few minutes. Wow, hey, that's how long it takes. All right, um, Jackson uh, Daminani. Uh, do you keep in touch with teammates from the Warriors Championship? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, yeah, we do. We do keep in touch with a fair few of them. Fessa Sazili, um, David Lee, I still talk to to this day, Barbosa, Harrison Barnes. And most of us, pretty much, like we'll have a reunion one day. And I think for most of those guys on that team as well, I think that was the most special one just because it was it was built from the ground up. Um, no disrespect to what happened late, later on, but obviously once KD joined, it was a super team. But I think that first one, just coming from literally – built up from, from a really bad team for the last 20 years was probably the most special. Did you, uh, do you have like a reunions, WhatsApp groups? Like you, you got, you got something. No, special. we just, sometimes there'll just be a random group chat that someone saw something funny and he's hanging shit on someone. But yeah, we'll probably have a reunion. I think it's 20 years in the NBA. I don't Holy even know. Holy shit. But essentially. Yeah, 15, 20 years. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> yeah, I might, might not be around by then. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, all right, last one. Um, uh, this is all right. Yeah, uh, RJIS underscore 89. Have you reached out to Ben Simmons one-on-one, not just with his recent fiasco, but in the lead-up to the Olympics? Maybe I mean, you talked about the lead-up to the boomers, but sort of how he handles at the moment? Nah, mate, he's a, he's a pretty hard man to get to. He's got uh, a, a, a wall of uh, handlers and people that you got to kind of navigate through those cobwebs just to get to him. So, 
you know, it's um, it's unfortunate. Rich Paul and he's got his, I think his brother or stepbrothers, he's, he's his manager, and you got to kind of go through them to get to him. And I don't, I don't, I don't do business that way. Like if I need to talk to him, I'll try to talk to him. If I have to go through all these different layers, I'm just like, yeah, I'm not doing that shit. E- like, e- rather e- just have- empathy for his situation, though, right? He's a, he's an Australian star in the NBA, um, and you know, you may not agree with how he's dealt with it, and you know, right or wrong. What, what what would he be going through? It'd be, it'd be tough, right? The way that his team's handled Yeah, real tough. Life. I mean, shit, like, they basically, at the end of that playoff series, all, all scapegoated him. I mean, he was a scapegoat. It was just like, oh, Ben did that. And, you know, he didn't have a great series, and um, if he played a little bit better, but he, he, does, he does a lot of things that don't show up on his stat sheet. He's still a tremendous player, um, and he's probably... You know, I just think the people around him are just not giving the right advice. That's what I think it's come down to, and I just hope that he... Can can just kind of distance himself from that eventually as as you grow into a man and just be like you know what I'm going to take the reins of my own career and I'm going to take your advice but I'm not always going to live your advice um, I'll listen and I, I don't think he's at that stage yet so I just hope um, I hope you can find happiness I hope you can find a place where you can get back on the basketball court but it's just not not looking good for anyone right now both Philly and him they both they both just it's just a dire situation. I did say that to have a Google of what you thought about Andrew Bogan and Ben Simmons, but there you go. There it is. Um, Bogues, our time's coming up. Free trial is ending in about 30 <laughs> seconds. So I wanted to finish with Rogue Bogues. I know you're doing your own thing in podcast land. Um, give it a listen. It's fun, right? Talking to people, doing your podcast. It's really good. Yeah, we talk shit. Yeah, a lot of different kind of series and ways we go on things. So I've enjoyed it so far and... Yeah, we're gonna get some. We've got some big guests planned for twenty. What are we in? Twenty two. Um, next next year. Yeah. So I'll be uh, I'll out. be available early January, mate. So um, we'll be right. on then. <laughs> so, me too. <laughs> All right, gents. That was a good one. I'm sorry, but that was a good one. Yeah. He's what a, a treat. Well, I mean, look, we apologise for. Uh, look, I'm going to name him Zencaster. We use Zencaster. Great mm-hmm. software. Um, we've used it for Tom Morris. We've used it for a few other guys. So Swamp, we're using it, but he didn't want us to show his face. Which is fine. And it's a great, great software, great platform. Yeah, we're well, not sponsored by, by the way. Yeah, we will be. They decided to do a 20-minute routine maintenance in the middle of the Andrew Bogut interview. I yep. could not believe it when I went on there. before. Like It was happened right before we interviewed Andrew. Yep. And... Uh, out of any time in the week they could have yeah, picked, yeah. the one little window was that. But that's so we had, okay. We had to chop it at 60 minutes, but we could have kept talking to him forever. He's a, yeah, and I'm sure he would have let us too. Yeah, well, maybe we'll get him back on later in the We end. definitely will. If you are listening to this and uh, you got it on uh, Spotify or iTunes and it's just a podcast, we are on YouTube. You should have heard that at the start of the episode, but we're on YouTube now. We'd love you to sign up, subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can literally just go on to YouTube, back chat podcast, <laughs> Hit the subscribe button if you wanna. If you want a little, little alert, little bing every time Dan bing drops bong. a nice little video online, you can hit the alarm bell as well. We're on YouTube. That's where we're going. We're doing video content. Yeah. Um. That it does not. We do not discriminate from our usual hookups, which are Instagram backchat underscore podcast, Twitter backchat underscore pod, or I might say. You can get on to Will Schofield. I went over the 10K follower mark on the yeah, weekend. Did. I did. The, the comma and three numbers turned into a letter, it which just, is a K. It just says 10K, and I Googled what happens when your followers go to 10K. You know what the answer is? What? Nothing. Nothing happens. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to say what happens with the mill. Does it go to an M? Uh, I don't know. You probably. Uh, yeah, it does. Bogues has got it. 1.3 M. Yeah, very. All right, that's the next goal. Probably get him to uh, repost this whole episode on his Twitter then, eh? Hopefully. Reddit uh, forward slash back chat podcast. I see you over there now, Reddit. I do see what you're doing over there. It's all it? very good. Well, I kind of get it now. I never got it. I do get it now. TikTok. We're on TikTok now. Yeah, I don't we're know, trying. I don't know what's happening. You know what? There. The more you get involved in our socials like TikTok and YouTube, the more we can put out because it's hard to it's hard to do something in a, in a space where we're not really getting any traction. We, so you, well, you get involved. We'll get more out there. We we see the numbers that listen to this show and we appreciate, one, I'm sorry other listeners, but we appreciate our patrons the most mm. because they're putting their money where their mouth is a little bit and it's not a lot and we do appreciate the support you give the podcast. It allows us to be able to spend a bit more time on, on this stuff because it, it sounds like a bit of a sob story here, but like a bit of time goes in this for you guys. So the more of you guys that are involved, we do appreciate it. 
But overall, like Dan says, the more that get involved, the more that we can build this community, we got something big brewing. I'm telling you. I, I wanted to give a shout out to a couple of people. I hit up a lot of people. I need you while we're talking to go onto Patreon. Someone gave us a $20 a month sub. I yeah. need, we need to give them a shout out while you're finding who that is. I know who it is. Um, I already know. I don't know. Look it up. Someone, I asked someone, hey, can you go up on our YouTube and just give it a sub? And he said, sure, but I need you to drop my name a bunch of times. And I said, I'll give it to you once. And that's Tom Griebel. So, Tom, thanks for subbing to the YouTube channel. Really appreciate it. Tom, you sucked him in, mate. You just got. Two Toms and your last name, and I've said Tom twice. <laughs> he, he did say eight, I think, originally, so he's almost there. Um, our patrons basically give us the ability to give you more content, yeah. video. Uh, like, it's it's all it's all thanks to them. Matt O'Donoghue is the man. Um, very good. I'm not going to say that's all me, but it is. Matt's a very big friend of the family. Um, done a few bit of charity work with Matt with uh, Men's Talk, my uh, my men's health charity. Which again, we're going to start getting into. So, like you're here today, we're talking about Andrew. We're talking to Andrew Bogut. It's not just the West Coast podcast here anymore, which I love. Yeah. I love the club, and that's always I'll bleed blue and yellow, and a bit of red, but I do like branching out a bit. So we've got a few guys lined up over the next couple of weeks. We appreciate the patron support. Once again, you want to you want to send it. You want us to read it. Hello at backchatpodcast.com.au. One more thing. Yes. I know you're so eager to... You know what I, no, you know what I want to finish with, but yeah. Uh, oh, maybe this is what I'm going to ask you. You know that thing that you messaged me about through the week? Oh, mate. I, you sh- if, if our patrons want to see a bit of inside info, it'll be our, it'll be our message <laughs> thread during the week. Oh, yeah. Which thing? The one, the, the screenshot. Oh, the, no, wait. We put Which it up, screenshot? I just remembered we put it up on Instagram. Quirky Jerky. Yeah. Oh, oh my gosh. Quirky Jerky. The exclusive supplier of <laughs> jerky to the podcast, and we have not got a pack of it down here. Just realised we've done the whole podcast without a pack of it upstairs? jerky. It's upstairs. I can't wait to get my hands on some. Right. I love jerky. It may not even be there anymore. I've been eating it all week. Are you serious? I promise next week, quirky jerky's going to be front and centre. Okay. Be quirking my jerking. <laughs> Can I end on that? We can end on that. Backchatpodcast.com.au. It's got everything you need. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs>